We are living in exciting times. As a chemical engineer, I was trained in building refineries. But who is talking about refineries anymore? Except perhaps at the TU Delft. At the TU Delft, we have the e-refinery program. And the e-refinery program is basically about the factories of the future, where we're using electricity to transform molecules just like CO2, water and nitrogen into the chemicals and the materials which we need for the future. And here in this laboratory, together with TNO, the Department of Process Energy, are working on basically scaling this type of reaction. And here you see a nice example where you can see the transformation of CO2 to formic acid. But as well, you can make from CO2 molecules like CO or ethylene. These are molecules which we are still going to need in the far future. So here you can see then that electrons can really help us to drive our renewable economy and getting it towards a circular carbon concept, because that is what we need. Hi, my name is Varun Kothari and I'm a master student here at the Department of Energy and Process Technology. This is, we are right now in the Process and Energy Lab and uh, here we have a lot of uh, experiments regarding energy technology and storage, process intensi intensification and multi-phase systems. Uh, right now, this is uh, the setup I am currently working on and it is um, a novel twin screw compressor which is used in a part of a heat pump and it's going to be used later on for upgrading waste heat streams for district heating purposes. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Fan. I'm a postdoc in uh, the micro and nano engineering department of uh, Precision Microsystems Engineering. Uh, we're in front of the NanoScribe lab. NanoScribe is a tool. Uh, basically, it's a 3D printer that can print uh, very small uh, structures, uh, down to 50 nanometers small. So you can build uh, 3D objects that are you know, mi uh, nanometer, micrometer sized. And why that's uh, interesting for us is uh, when you get down to those length scales, you start interacting with things like biological cells, DNA, and you can also play around with optics, so play around with the wavelength of light is at that sort of uh, length scale. This is the tool itself, and you can see that someone is printing already. This person is printing a surface uh, that has tiny pillars, and these pillars cause cells to differentiate in different ways. So she's studying how the, the surface of pillars is going to cause um, stem cells to differentiate into neurons or to glial cells. So this is one thing that we can do. And then we have some uh, 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 chemistry uh, equipment to help develop and, and make these uh, um, structures. And you'll notice that the room is yellow and that's just to prevent UV radiation from getting inside and exposure, exposing these chemicals. It's basically like a photo lab. Because we're working with such small features, uh, it needs, the environment needs to be fairly clean. So we wear uh, lab coat and, and uh, protective equipment to keep our samples from being contaminated. Uh, it's not a true clean room because there is no uh, laminar flow, but uh, the room is filtered and, and, and uh, we try to keep things clean, wearing gloves and that sort of thing. We call a towing tank small when it is just 85 meters long. Here, researchers from bachelor's level on can study ships and floating structures in regular and irregular waves at speeds up to three meters per second. Water depths range from shallow to deep water at scale. In the large towing tank, almost twice as big as the small one, 1.5 million liters of water can make your maritime research topics float. Ships, in this case a sailing mega yacht, are tested in all conditions, from calm water up to heavy storms. The model can either sail freely or is forced into distinct motions by a six degree of freedom hexapod. The hexapod is a unique test device that can exert loads in different directions simultaneously, accurately and powerfully. In just one month, it can mimic the complex loads a ship will experience during 20 years of use.
Hi, I'm Virginia Bertolo. I'm a PhD student here uh, in the Material Science and Engineering Department at TU Delft. Uh, now we are in the mechanical lab and I'm going to show you the three main equipments that we use here. So this one here behind me is the fracture toughness machine. Uh, we use it to perform some bending tests, for example, it's the one that I'm performing uh, during my research. And we use specimens like this, so we can apply loads and see how the crack grows and the resistance that this material has to the crack growth. Later, we can analyze the fracture surface, for example, to see how the microstructure interacts with the uh, structure of the material and to know how this microstructure affect the fracture toughness of the material. This is a hardness machine where we can also apply a load and from the indent, the mark that we have in our material, measuring this uh, residual mark, we can also measure another property that is the hardness and also important to understand the microstructure that we have there. So this is the tensile machine. This is also to analyze the properties of the material, but in this case, we have specimens like this. And when putting here, we can uh, apply a actual load and then measure important properties for the development of materials and to understand how will be the performance of the material in a structural operation, for example. Welcome, my name is uh, John van den Dobbelsteen. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biomechanical Engineering. And we are here in the MISIT lab. The main focus is on the development of uh, medical technology for minimally invasive procedures. So these are the procedures where the uh, doctors use very tiny tools to operate within the body of the patient and not to damage too much uh, healthy tissue. That's quite challenging, so we are developing instruments, even robotic devices, to uh, help these uh, uh, doctors doing the procedure. And we also uh, develop training facilities like these to uh, let them practice in, in, in using these uh, very tiny instruments uh, in an appropriate way. Next to that, when you develop medical technology, you bring in new technology in the operating room. This is new for the doctors. They also have to be able to use the technology uh, in a safe way. So next to the technology itself, we develop monitoring systems to support them in using the technology. So it's not only the technology itself, but also everything related uh, to safety and uh, ensuring that the patient is, is helped in the best manner. So welcome here at the uh, DCSC lab, the Delft Center for Systems and Control. Uh, my name is Jan-Willem van Wingene, I'm one of the professors in uh, this department. One of the topics we work on is, is energy, and in particular we work on, on wind energy research. So for wind turbines and wind farms, we develop control algorithms to maximize the energy capture and to minimize the loading such that these machines can stand offshore for 20 years. So what is our approach? We combine models with data to come up with the best control solutions. So the data is coming from real wind turbines or is coming from our scaled models. So here you see one of our latest prototypes and this prototype has all the control degrees of freedom that you need. So it has individual pitch control and we can also control the RPM, the rotor speed of this machine. And on this machine we can test uh, advanced control algorithms and we do that in different wind tunnels here in Delft but also in Germany or Italy. So that's for turbine control but also we have the farm control problem where you see that there is interaction between turbines. So the first turbine is extracting energy out of the wind and the, the second turbine is suffering from that so there is interaction. What we try to do is come up with algorithms to maximize uh, the energy capture of this wind farm. And we do that with academic partners, but also with industry. Like our wind farm control algorithms will be tested in the field in 2025. My name is Boris Schierkow. Well, we are located in, now in Sviemi, in the Vickel lab, near our driving simulator. And 
uh, my PhD student Yang Guzhen now is driving it. You see our driver simulator is consists on the several high-level components. Stewart platform, which can provide up to 1G uh, acceleration in any direction. Then you have on the top mock-up, uh, which is a half Yaris, uh, connected with a virtual vehicle. And on the screen you see visualization generated, graphical world generated by three projectors. We are doing uh, several research using this uh, Delft Advanced Vehicle Simulator. Uh, first of all, we are looking on the scenarios how to support driver in emergency situations which cannot be easily tested on the regular roads. Then, forward, uh, looking on the automation uh, of the vehicle, how the driver or passenger in this case will perceive automation and how we can improve motion comfort. Also, uh, some of my colleagues uh, from human-robot interaction they are interested in, in to understand how the driver will interact with automated vehicles and in this case uh, the haptic feedback is essential. Multiple sensors on the Toyota Prius are recording the environment. All the important objects in the environment are then uh, being detected with the detector which is shown here in the left video. The detections are then used uh, to estimate the actual position and velocities, or in other words, the tracks of these objects, and that's shown here in the right video. Mm -hmm. 